Hello, everyone. Thank you so much again for being here today. Uh, we have up on stage some true pioneers in the area of blockchain development, particularly in the area of layer one blockchain development. And so super excited to introduce these fine gentlemen. Uh, we have Ilya Pluskin, um, who is the uh, co-founder of Near Protocol. Uh, we have Kevin Seknici, who is the CEO and co-founder of Ava Labs. We have Silvio McCauley, co-founder of Algorand, and Anatoly Yakovenko, co-founder of Solana Labs. So to get started, let's just go down the row here and talk a little bit about your particular technology. Talk a little bit about what makes it unique, a few features that distinguish it from competitor blockchains out there. Go ahead. For sure, yeah. I think Near kind of focuses on two main things. How do we build something that is really simple to build and use for kind of normal users and normal developers? And how do we scale beyond what kind of one single machine can do? And so doing sharding, doing kind of scale up with uh, capacity to target billions of users. Um, not too dissimilar, I would say. I think um, we, we view uh, blockchain development as user-centric. Um, so we want to develop things that are uh, fitting for most kinds of applications, yet keep them in a, uh, in a generic way, a generic framework for generic tooling. Um, hence, what we've built is uh, uh, both very fast blockchain architectures, but also uh, architectures that can horizontally scale, like, for example, with subnets. So, um, and then at the end of the day, it's what we want to do is own uh, the, the blockchain stack as much as possible so that we can create for users a very unified blockchain experience so they don't even have to think about it. Our goal is, uh, in an ideal utopian world, nobody even talks about Avalanche. It just uses it in the back end, and everything is just kind of like happening magically. So. Great. So uh, Algorand, we are very proud of so having solved uh, the original trilemma. So we do scale and, and uh, totally decentralized and secure. We are also green. Our blockchain never forks. You can rely on a block as soon as it appears. And um, by the way, you know, we have been producing over 20 million blocks every 4.4 seconds without any interruption of service. Um, so Solana, our, our big dream is to build a, a chain that can synchronize global information as close to the speed of light as possible. And I'd say we're like, you know, 1% of the way there. <laughs> um, and the use case we, we dreamed uh, that would run on, on something like Solana was um, central limit order books or something like Serum. And initially, you know, our, you know, we even thought we might at some point, you know, flip NASDAQ and get all the equities in the world and everything that's traded to actually be traded on this open platform. Because if you have a permissionless open platform for price discovery, all that information is now available to everybody in the world. Every hobbyist, anyone can be playing at the same level playing field as Alameda or Jump Trading. Excellent. So let's actually start with you, Anatoly, to talk about NASDAQ as a great example. So the NASDAQ stock exchange, it processes around a million actions per second. We're nowhere near a million actions per second on blockchains. This is the number of TPS, transactions per second, is critical. Um, whether it's you know, tens of transactions per second on some of the earliest chains to, let's say, in the thousands right now, how do we actually scale a blockchain to be in the millions of transactions per second? Or is that not even the goal? Is, it, is, is there a much more important milestone that doesn't really require us to reach that level of scale? What's your thought on that? So that might not be the goal for everyone, but for us, that's the goal. And our approach is pretty simple because um, that TPS is limited by the bandwidth available to the validators. So if you imagine they're all running on 10 gigabit networks, which are globally available, you can fit about 2.5 million transactions into 10 gigabits, assuming you have the software and the hardware to actually process all the cryptographic signatures, find all the storage and the state associated with it, and churn through that data. And that, that part is really, really hard. That's building uh, a really fast database and a really fast operating system. And when you look at historically things like that, like Windows, like Linux, uh, you know, something like Oracle or SQL, that took 10 years to build. And that's a hard engineering problem that requires a long commitment from a, a, you know, a large engineering team. 
Um, and we're about you know four years into it, so you know we still have a lot a lot to go. But from our perspective, these are all achievable. It's just an engineering challenge. Excellent. So, so first of all, your last question: Should we aspire to have a millions of uh, transaction per seconds? Absolutely. A technologist who doesn't want to, uh, who, who puts a ceiling on uh, performance is a dead technologist, okay? So we should certainly do it. Can we do it today? Well, we could by cheating. If I just saying, you know, uh, take, you know, a thousand shards, uh, two validators each, a thousand transaction uh, per shards, bingo, we have a million of a thing. But to do it, we have to do it responsibly and, uh, and uh, without uh, a cheating, that is an important thing, in a really decentralized manner. It is possible, I agree with Anatoly, and we will get there. By the way, everybody gets very creative. First of all, we are a very creative group here, and uh, everybody gets creative, even the NASDAQ, when they start talking about uh, transaction. You mentioned actions, not transactions. Maybe it's a bids and ask. <laughs> Big difference, right? So for us at Algorand, everything is about finality. So we finalized real transactions in 4.4 uh, seconds. NASDAQ, the last time I heard, is a T plus two, two what? Two days. And now we're talking about the revolutionary thing. <laughs> T plus one day. How about a few seconds and we are done with finality? I think that's why we are going to win over uh, the world. You're right. It's not an apples to oranges comparison no, between no. the instant final settlement of blockchain and while we have these great centralized exchanges out there that can process many transactions per second, but then a settlement system that might take one, two, or three days. And, and to your earlier point, we don't want to end up with a thousand different shards with a thousand messages per second, call it a million, but they can't talk to each other at all. That's not, also not the goal here at all. Kevin, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think Silvio and Anatoly pretty much nailed a lot of the uh, uh, main points here. So a technology, a, a decentralized blockchain is just a, a database that is replicated, right? It's a, it's a system where we can interact with information stored on it and do meaningful things with it. Um, we should not aim to uh, establish any sort of ceiling whatsoever to these meaningful interactions. Um, but of course, um, you know, the decentralization definition, it's more of an art than a science. Defining decentralization is really more of an art. Like, it's a flavor. And it feels like the more we, we rush towards increasing that ceiling, the more we uh, end up creating systems that are very centralized because very few entities can run these sort of systems. So you have to like play a very uh, a slow game of uh, uh, you know, building better algorithms, better uh, infrastructure slowly over time to uh, ingest all of the demand without sort of like perturbing too much the, the decentralization aspect of it. So it's very, it's very undefined, right? It's, it's very more art uh, than anything else. Uh, but, but generally speaking, there should not be a, a, a ceiling whatsoever as long as we are not hurting, ultimately, the user interaction. So we can create very um, esoteric types of operating systems that are potentially extremely fast, but nobody can program in them. Um, they're going to be completely useless. Right. So we want to build things that are very, very useful, that stay, you know, quote unquote decentralized, and I put it on quotes because again, it's not mathematically defined, um, while also incrementing speed and operation, everything with clever algorithms uh, and uh, with uh, the, the new hardware that comes along every, every year. So that's, that's the goal, I think. For sure. Ilya? Yeah, just to add actually on Antonio's and Silvio's point, the Transactions per second should be kind of transaction finalized per second. Sure. Because you can actually process right now a million transactions per second and then take, for example, seven days to finalize them like some rollups do. Right. Uh, and so really it's yeah, the question of like how fast you can put uh, kind of processing through and everybody knows that this has actually been achieved. And so yeah, and NASDAQ is like it's kind of actually I wanted to look up and see what is the actual processing power that that is there because there's no actual like spec on what what that is lately but yeah going beyond that we kind of to add to Kevin's point users don't care like users will just want to come use the applications not pay you know insane fees ideally not pay anything and you know achieve the values they're trying to achieve and so 
as we're doing all this work, it's really important to kind of keep it under the hood, right? Keep continue building the experience that is consistent while you know iterating and in innovating on the technologies underneath. And that's like a lot a lot of ways kind of trying to use this approach everywhere we can, right? So I want to follow up on two questions based on things that were said. So first Kevin talked about what is a blockchain really? It's a decentralized database that's replicable and we can track the state, it's transparent. When is it appropriate? Here's a very fundamental question. When is it appropriate to use a blockchain as opposed to a normal centralized database technology? What kinds of applications do you think, let's say, aren't something that we should put on blockchains? Or, or should we aspire to put basically all of the application states and actions that exist out there, everything from financial applications all the way up through games and everything in between on blockchains? This is for anyone. So for me, Web3 is about low switching cost. It's not actually, decentralization is a tool to achieve low switching costs, right? We living in a world of Web2 where, you know, if you want to leave Facebook, you're not able to. If you want to, you know, leave your bank, it's actually super complicated. If you want to leave like Time Warner Cable, similar. And so what we're trying to achieve in Web3 is ability to switch really easily, which promotes competition, which promotes kind of build out uh, of you know, innovation and, and kind of pushes all of us pretty much to continue innovating as well. And to achieve that, right, pretty much you can think of like if there's an app, what are the things you need to do to uh, offer low switching costs, right? If it's a game, well, if your assets are kind of on chain, then you know, people can switch, people can trade, people can do all kinds of things. If they're not, if they're in a centralized database, then like the entity that built the game controlling it. Now, Maybe the graphics, right, and, and other stuff is not that important and does not need to live on chain. And so generally, it's anything that's kind of involved multi-party that is marketplace, that is kind of interacts and where user should be owning this, not the developer, not the kind of uh, whoever runs the operator, but anyone who actually um, like puts it in or, or interacts with it. And so like, any use case, which pretty much everyone has some piece of that in their system, should be going on chain. And then you can still build a lot of infrastructure around it, which means that user can switch to another one at any time. Um, we're, we're singularly focused on this idea of uh, global price discovery. And um, I think uh, it applies to almost everything that we do in the digi digital space. Right now, like. Most everything that uh, how the web is monetized is goes through some ad exchange. So when you open a website, your identity is vectorized, and then your pixels are sold in, a, in an ad exchange, and somebody buys them, and that ad is displayed. If you have new business models that don't depend on ads like NFTs, you can then build social networks where folks and communities inside those networks trade those NFTs, and the platform can make money without serving any ads, without stealing anyone's data, and not using an ad exchange at all. But for something like that to exist at the same scale that you have Web2 applications like Facebook, the cost to do so has to be really, really low. I think much, much lower than a Google ad, which is about 0.2 cents. So the way we think about it is like, can we drive the cost of creating these digital things, the offers, the ask, the bids, to the point that it's cheaper to do that than serving an ad? And if that's true, then I think uh, you know, next generation social networks, next generation web applications can scale that business model to the same audiences that we have traditional ones. Um, but the challenge is that cost, and, that, and that's, a, that's a hard problem. Absolutely. So another well, thing I wanted to follow up on was you mentioned roll-ups. So all four of you, you guys build layer one blockchains and protocols. Um, layer twos are becoming more popular now. Of course, there's uh, optimistic rollups, there's zero knowledge rollups. Many people see these as the answer to the scaling problem of getting that high transactions per second while sacrificing some of the sort of simplicity of just going to one base layer chain. W what do you guys think about layer twos? Do you see them being a part of your ecosystem or do you feel that they're not necessary? Talk to me about that. Kevin, go ahead. Um, so, so <laughs> I get on a lot of Twitter fights about this, uh, <laughs> and I get trolled a lot. Uh, the, real, uh, uh, you know, the reality of the situation is um, that uh, even though I like to poke, uh, you know, because technologically speaking, I don't necessarily agree with it, um, I also don't, I am not uh, in a position to argue 
what somebody feels, uh, like, or rather how somebody feels their data should be managed, right? Uh, if somebody feels that uh, a zero knowledge way uh, of putting data in an off-chain of solution and then bringing it back to the uh, layer one feel, makes their you know, system more secure, um, I'm all for diplomacy, they should do it. Um, I don't agree with the technical approach. Um, I'm sure Silvio has a lot. I mean, he's the creator of Zero Knowledge, uh, <laughs> literally the founder of Zero Knowledge. <laughs> so he would have a few things to say about that. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, uh, all these tools that I said, you know, they're very nuanced to explain. There is reasons when we're building distributed systems not to, uh, not to have to think about which one of these is the secure layer one, which one of these is not the secure layer one, because these are not defined mathematically. Um, and adding this additional complexity of having to build these smart contracts that you know, take a look at the state uh, in a zero knowledge way of some other chain and bring it here, it adds so much complexity, so much uh, burden, undue burden to the users uh, that at the end of the day, I'm not sure it's worth the effort of, or rather the, the potential undefined reduction security of just having, let's say, something like uh, another L2 uh, or an another L1 and bridging to it, right? Like, which one is more secure? Well, until you mathematically define what decentraliz decentralization means which there is no mathematical definition, then you can't make any of those such arguments. So we're really arguing over matters of subjectivity. And at the end of the day, it's just, which one do you like more as a user? For me, as a builder, I want to build things that I think are going to make the user less frustrated. So L2s in their current form are in the mode where they make the user more frustrated. So that's why I would, I would go with not the... But at the end of the day, L2s, you know, subnets, they can be shared security, so they can easily be L2s as well. Um, and I am diplomatic. I don't take any side to, to this. I just want to build things that people like. That's all. Well, yeah, I think it's interesting. We haven't really defined exactly what decentralized means. We haven't quite defined what scalability really means here. And with that subjectivity results in different solutions, which is okay. We're definitely in an exploring time right now, trying to figure out what's going to actually work, what are users going to care about, what are developers going to want to develop on. But uh, you're right, there's a lot of hot, heated debates on social media about <laughs> yes. this exact topic. But, so. but I, th I think there are two things that we can optimize for. Uh, reduction of user frustration and increase in developer joy. These two are things that we know how to optimize for because they're measurable. So technology should be around those two yeah. things, I think. Totally agree. Breta, um, just <clears throat> I'm very much in favor of uh, layer one smart contracts for a, a variety of reasons, because they are actually set on layer one, which is the most secure la layer in every blockchain, and everybody knows what it means. So there is no, no danger that I hire somebody to write a, a layer two smart contract for doing X, somebody hires somebody else for doing the right smart contract, a layer two for doing the same X, and the two of them don't talk to each other. But if you do it at layer one, they will guarantee to talk to each other. So we spend a lot of time to do it right, and we are now happy to announce that we are feature complete in our layer one um, uh, smart contracts. And in my opinion, at least 80% of whatever they need for smart contract is in Algon, we could do it at, at layer one. But there is always something more esoteric, something which is extremely computational in intensive something that uh, it is going to take an enormous amount of memory. And therefore, we are also looking to develop you know, a layer two. Our layer two will be, like our consensus, rather different, and, uh, but it's going to be um, very different for whatever everybody else interprets right now for, lay for layer two. So I think we do need a layer two, but we should, uh, as much as we can, we should do a layer one. And if I may want to say, previously, should we use a, a centralized database? Sure, if you want to maintain the status quo, if you want to people, <laughs> keep people in the darkness. That is a technological barrier. If we break, as we are committed to do all of here in the stage, to really make decentralization available for, to everybody, there is no damn reason to use a centralized database for anything. That is a, 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 a main way in which we are going to exclude people. Because a central database say, tells you suddenly that you don't belong. And why don't you belong? That is a no-no for me. If you like fairness, if you like transparency, if you like common knowledge, there is no reason that we should handle anything by centralized database. They are only to perpetuate power that is already entrenched and uh, concentrated on the hands of a few. 
not for us. I mean, I don't fully, like for example, let's say Harvard University wants to maintain the transcripts of the students, right? It doesn't fully make sense for them to store everything in public blockchain public. Like they missed, because they are the owner of the data and the attestation of it, it makes sense for them to store it and then just provide these attestations to the users in public, in a public protocol, in a public communication. Ilya, I agree with you, but uh, given you mentioned zero knowledge, <laughs> there are ways in which you can have your cake and eat it too. Because sure. uh, in, in so far that, you know, uh, sure, we know when to publish things, you can uh, have a privacy. But the notion that you can prove data about yourself to one of our students who work very hard, coming from abroad, at great expense to graduate from MIT, and when MIT is about to tell you whether or not he or she has graduated, no. <laughs> you can keep the privacy, but if I graduate, I want to prove it to the world. So, I mean, yeah, yes, I'm exaggerating. There is always <laughs> a, a little um, a sliver of a uh, database, but if things are, when things are done you know, properly, there should be nothing that stops us for provably sharing the truth with the rest of the world. And, and that goes to the fact of what is decentralization. That's what I'm saying. It's more about kind of switching costs and ability to prove things, which means you want to have sometimes authenticated data structure without having decentralized, but then you're still able to prove, you're still able to communicate and work together. So uh, I think this is going back, like we really need to define what we say when we say decentralization, because like it's, it's too easy to get into this like, hey, let's decentralize everything but then you still have RPC nodes, you still have wallets, which are points of centralization, but they're easy to switch from. There is the cost of switching from one RPC node to another is zero. Costing from switching from one wallet to another is zero. Even though they are centralized, but you have options, you have ability to switch. And that's, for me, that's what decentralization is, right? Like similarly, how we produce blocks, you know, we have lots of centralized computers that are doing it, but the switching cost is low, right? Any one of them can go offline and the network will continue working. And so I think like defining more decentralization around the switching cost parameters is important. So I think um, the, the question here, of, I want something you can say that earlier about composability. I want to go back to that for a second. So composability uh, yeah. about if you have just layer two applications, for example, um, they might not be able to compose well with each other. And that's a problem, as opposed to if everything's happening on one chain. Another way to achieve composability is through uh, backwards compatibility with existing smart contracts, for example. So let's talk about the Ethereum virtual machine. So at a high level, should there be a, a standard that everyone agrees on for smart contracts, for the development of smart contracts, for the language we use to develop them? Uh, should we continue to sort of separate and innovate that way? Why did each of you choose to, for example, develop or not develop EVM compatibility with your chains? So, totally. you know, <laughs> Solana is not EVM compatible. Um, and that choice was really because the use case we're building for is this idea of, you know, a NASDAQ that nobody owns. And EVM is not designed for that kind of performance. Um, so we simply didn't prioritize or, or try to build for that. And it turned out to be actually a great choice because engineers are naturally curious. And when you give them new tools, they'll try them and learn them. And they discover new ways of building things. And that allowed the Solana community to kind of build its own group of folks like Armani, like Paul, that are building amazing tools, amazing applications, and are really their own. It's, it's their own group of, group of people. Um, and that's been, I think, kind of probably the strongest the strongest uh, engine for growth in Solana has been this new independent group of engineers. Yeah, I must uh, say that uh, <clears throat> I agree with Anatoly, and uh, let me go a step farther even. Nothing can be more pernicious than premature standardization. We are now seeing incredible progress, and everything is uh, in improving so fast which is a very bad idea to start standardizing now. I believe in diversity, you know, in gender, in races, and yes, in technology. So we, with the fact that we somehow co coalesce on a, um, of an initial uh, group of technology is, a very, is stifling. We don't want to get there. Not, no, I, I really believe that uh, we, sh uh, we should have different blockchains with different technology. 
and we should allow our assets to go very easily and safely from blockchain to blockchain where it can be served be better. And that's what we want to do, not to somehow a uniform where uh, everybody is equal. Everybody has to be better at something than somebody else, and, and, and the assets should be able to go around. And, um, uh, frankly, always try to be compatible, because what is the reason? So, oh, this chain has a lot uh, of assets. I want to be compatible with that chain. Let me be clear. The assets we are going to see on our blockchain, if we do it right, is unbelievably more than whatever assets we have now. And so, and, and to do that, so we should not try to emulate one particular blockchain or not. We should develop our own brand, our own strength, and everybody is going to be great at something, and that is going to be a much better world, provided that we let, you know, interoperability be done right directly from chain to chain, and not to some mediators that, you know, to facilitate some shaky bridges that uh, nobody wants to go through. How about for Avalanche? Um, so, so I have to take a different view. Um, the, so going back to your question of like, well, should we decentralize or not? I, I don't, the answer to that is I don't know. People want to do things, different applications. I am not an arbiter of what people want to do. If people want more trust, they do the decentralization and all that. But to me, it seems like um, forcing, like, or rather like going the path of, of not having standards, it's just creating an incredible amount of pain. Imagine, for example, if you know, we built the internet by an HTTP standard, CSS, they're terrible, they're absolutely awful. Like JavaScript, um, even though I love uh, Brendan, um, he, it is not the best language to develop in, but it's the standard. And imagine if instead, of, of having this unified standard across web technologies. We had Firefox only understands HTTP, and then Chrome only understands XYZ, and then Safari only understands ABC. Um, you would have to develop across multiple standards, across multiple different browser uh, ecosystems, rather than just one unified experience. It would be an absolute disaster. It is terrible, the current infrastructure, but it is good enough to get things done, and it just gets kind of improved over time. Um, going to the blockchain version, EVM is not also the best standard at all, uh, but it is, I, I mean, it's, it's not just, I'm not saying this ideologically, I'm just literally saying this empirically speaking. Every technology goes towards a rapid but bad standardization, and then you just kind of deal with the consequences later on. Um, and this is probably what's, what needs to happen for uh, blockchain space as well. Everybody moves to the EVM, it's not the best, but we'll deal with the consequences later on. At least users will have, developers will have unified experiences across all blockchains. Users will have very unified tooling across all blockchains, not like, just like Fanta for Solana, it doesn't work for EVM. No, you have MetaMask for EVM, doesn't work for Solana. Like what the hell is this? It's just complete mess. So yeah, it sucks, but it's the lesser of the two evils. So standardize fast and then deal with the consequences later on because then everything just kind of falls into place. Um, empirically speaking, this happened in, in, in the OS, uh, 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 era, in the phone era, in the web era, in pretty much every era where there were different technologies and they had some sort of a communication uh, standard. It always happened where the communication standard was rapidly uh, uh, ossified, um, even though it was far from, from perfect. And experimentation at this stage, 12 years after we started all this experiment, I, I don't know what we're doing. Like, just, just ossify already. Just get it done and then just proceed with, uh, with, with building tooling on top of it. And Nir has a pretty innovative approach to this. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so we started, so we're developers, right? We tried to build on, like, on Ethereum a uh, few things before we, we launched Nier. And I mean, EVM is very kind of, has a lot of drawbacks. And coming, building developer experiences, right? It's, kind of was paramount that you open up the platform, right? You want, like, I mean, back in 2018, there was probably, like, I don't know, a few thousand developers in Solidity. Right now, it's maybe, like, 10,000 uh, in the world. We're talking about, you know, 10 million, 20 million JavaScript developers. We're talking about, you know, Rust, which is probably the language that, you know, growing really rapidly, there's probably hundreds of thousands of people who are learning it one way or another. 
we're talking about you know, Go, there's tons of languages, there's tons of platforms. And so for us, it was important to offer pretty much the kind of most generic way for people to run stuff, right? Like what Near really is underneath is a way to run your microservices with a database. Like that's as sim simplest as that. And your microservice can be written in anything that you want. And so Rust obviously being kind of more secure, just better language uh, for kind of you know, financial applications, for blockchain applications. And so that's been one of the first things. But we do have offered JavaScript like compilation. There's more languages coming. I think like there's like two or three other languages supported now. And then because of this generic architecture, you can take existing EVM code, right? The actual piece of the code that is run inside Ethereum and just run it as a service on Near. And so we have Aurora, which is an example of this, where you just literally run a whole container, which is whole Ethereum chain as just one smart contract on Near. And this is where like, the kind of sharding underneath is able to like, shuffle it, you know, give it performance, allocate the whole shard if needed for the whole contract. And so from this perspective, like, what we want to build is this ability for developers to build what they want, what they need, in the language they want, right? And then more and more kind of SDKs and languages are being launched. And then on top of it, you want to build experience for the user, right? I mean, the point that like, hey, this wallet doesn't work with this, this wallet doesn't work with this is very valid, right? So on Nier, again, because of the architecture, you can make MetaMask work for Nier. You can make Phantom Wallet uh, with Solana account to work on Nier as well. Like it's all possible, and uh, Aurora been kind of showcasing that. And there's actually like experiments to running other wallets as well. So, kind of at the end, I think like what we're trying to offer is the most generic computational platform, and then offer developers ways to build new experiences and both support existing experiences that have been proven with billions of dollars. I think like the thing about EVM was all the personally like me, you know, not wanting to build for it, but at the same time, it has you know whatever, a few hundred billion dollars of assets being proven out, both CVM itself and the smart contracts in it. And you cannot dismiss that. And so with that, like, let's offer kind of the most generic thing. Let's attract all the developers. We need a lot more developers. Like all of us are looking for developers constantly, right? This is the most kind of scarce resource in this space. Us too. Us too. And, exactly. Yes. And so like, we need to offer as much flexibility for developers and then kind of hide this blockchain from users. Like they don't really care. Yeah, s similar, I mean, we take a similar approach at, uh, at Avalanche as well. So you can actually build generic virtual machines um, for any of the subnets, uh, Wasm, whatever you have. Um, just purely speaking from an empirical perspective, it seems like EVM is, like nobody comes to us and says, hey, we want to uh, launch a subnet with anything else besides the, the EVM support. It just seems to be like the, the standard. And um, again, we want to support the, we have our own personal opinion uh, on what is better and what isn't. But to us, it's like, whatever you want to do. It's, you know, if you want to do EVM, then, you know, EVM is, is the way to go. So as each of your ecosystems becomes more successful, more users, more developers, more assets and liquidity, there's the flip side of that, which is that it fragments the space of liquidity more between each of your four ecosystems. Do you think this necessitates a multi-chain world where we need to have bridging between these different blockchains, these different protocols? Or is it OK for these islands to form? Or maybe another question is, do you think it's going to be a little bit of like a winner-takes-all type scenario between them? What do you guys think, Anatoly? Um, I mean, in theory, Solana, if it becomes the engine of price discovery for the world, will make FTX be an application on top of Solana, right? So it's kind of competitive with every, with every exchange out there. But in practice, I think it's really, really hard to achieve that. And you will have people that want to use different things for different reasons, which may be even as, as simple as the language that the docs are written in is more localized to, the, to their market. So those, those very simple things that are very hard to analyze from like a pure numbers and performance reasons are do actually have huge impact in the world. Um, I think we'll probably be in a multi-chain world because these technologies are not the same as a browser or a mobile phone that consumers hold in their hand. They're back-end systems. And for a developer, it may be a pain to build for two or three back-end systems, but they can do it. The, all, all of us as engineers have, have had that experience. <laughs> so, yeah. but. 
for uh, an application that needs to deploy to a million users, you know, they're going to build for the dominant consumer you know, devices, which is going to be an iOS, Android, the browser. And there, it's very, very hard to be in a, in a very large multi-chain world. You, you end up with something very dominant very quickly. Yeah. Um, if there should be one blockchain and it's all gone, ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> In reality, we should expect more. Why? Because uh, um, it is uh, not easy but possible to be good at many things. But it's very hard to be great at a lot of things. And so, and I believe that uh, greatness is a human aspiration and a technology aspiration for all of us. And therefore, it is only natural that you are great at something and somebody else is great at something else. And we should expect if we put our effort and we really achieve great things, that there is going to be a multi-chain world. In fact, only when there is a static, I, I guess that it's going to be a single chain. So not 6,000 blockchains, but, uh, but uh, a dozen or two, yes, I do expect that. But because of this, in my opinion, it is also important that we take care now to establish this interoperability with these chains, because otherwise, if, if good bridges, decentralized bridges, I think that when you talk directly blockchain to blockchain without any mediator, there is no fragmentation. I think that is, we are all united and we all have our um, sweet spot and, 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 and niche, no matter how large, area of competence. And I really want to have a world in which we can fluctuate and you know, our needs are going to visit all of our blockchains the same way that you know, we all take uh, planes and go around the world in different countries for having different experience in uh, different food, <laughs> different architecture, different culture, uh, music, right? I mean, w what is this? I don't really believe that it's going to be a winner take all and actually it's going to be better for the world to keep you know, a level of competition, but we do need this flexibility of exploring each other's goodies and, uh, and having you know, uh, the best of all worlds. So let me uh, ask one last question here with the time we have left, which is, what is one killer application or maybe technological improvement that you're most excited about in terms of the future success of your ecosystem? I think for us, it's interesting to see pretty much as mass adoption is happening, right? As you know, millions of users are joining through applications like Sweatcoin and others, uh, social applications, that people want kind of stability, right? And so we see Stablecoin probably being one of the killer applications, which is kind of interesting for, you know, that all the blockchains end up uh, with kind of focusing on Stablecoins. But overall, that is something that, like, is easy to communicate to people. It reduces this risk and kind of fear that people have, right? And it's able to start moving people to actually, you know, receive salary in it, transact, and things like that. And so we see kind of in the New York system and broader in the Web3, like a lot more kind of of this technology is popping up and experimenting and seeing what will work. And so kind of that's, I think, is an interesting shift which has happened over past year um, as kind of like we're, we're you know, growing to actually like actual mass adoption, right? Like millions of users who are actually trying to use this. Um, there's actually a lot. Um, and I, I think they're, 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 they're coming uh, to age slowly now as, I guess, global reach starts becoming more and more possible. Um, but I think maybe one that I would be highlighting right now is, um, is something that seems simple in, in hindsight, but it wasn't so obvious in the early days of, of blockchain, which is that uh, the killer application is US dollars in the hands of everybody globally in their hands without having to go through any bank. Um, and, that's a, and that's a very powerful thing. Um, I get to have a bunch of US dollars. I am anywhere in the world. Um, I'm in India, I am uh, uh, in Europe. I have my own custody wallet, uh, self-custodied wallet. I get a bunch of US dollars in it, stables. I can now use that US dollars to pay uh, locally. I can use the US dollars to put them in a savings account on Aave and get yield. Um, it's personal banking, but done literally peer to peer. So now you can build insurance products. You can build uh, lending products that are all peer to peer, much more um, efficient at pricing than uh, uh, the, the current model. 
Um, and this is, I think, coming to age slowly now. We're not quite there yet, but it's, 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 it's obvious in hindsight, um, even though it wasn't so obvious early on with Bitcoin, because like the first thing was, oh, you know, digital gold or you know, something like that, which is not necessarily super right. useful. Savio. So, killer app, uh, I think, uh, what is the bread and butter of trade? Is an exchange of goods. You have an asset that I want, I have an asset that you want, and you want to swap it. We are very happy to deliver atomic swap by means of a single transaction at layer one in 4.24 seconds now, in 2.5 seconds at the end of this quarter, and at a fraction of a cent in cost. That, I think, is really the killer app. Whether the, the, uh, the, 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 not only uh, stable coins or, or whatever is uh, the assets, that, in my opinion, is so basic of commerce, this uh, elementary thing, that, that ought to be the killer app for anybody. In terms of technology, and uh, we are developing a lot of new technology which is going to become available at of, of the end of this quarter, but one is this uh, decentralized bridge, which I believe is really the solution to the fragmentation problem. I think that's what we, we want to be. The world is disaggregating. I see blockchains. We can unite the world, but they need to unite themselves, first of all. And so decentralized bridge, remember that uh, right now are not safe. Whenever you want to go from a blockchain to another, you see some shaky thing, and you kiss your asset goodbye, hoping that uh, it can come back when uh, you, you are done with the service over there. And so what do we need is uh, a blockchain to blockchain directly without any intermediary, because we have not developed all this wonderful decentralized ass uh, um, um, uh, tool, uh, um, um, ecosystems, and then connected what? By one mediator who tells you you can pass, you cannot pass, or five, three out of five, and what? They post some bonds that say, here is a $10 million bond. If your asset doesn't come back and make you whole. Let's not kidding ourselves. So a blockchain that works should secure you know, trillions of dollars in assets on one side and on the other side. And all these mediators with their piggy banks of $10 million, first of all, how do you collect them? You sue them in which jurisdiction? And assuming that you do, what is $10 million relative to the trillions of assets? It makes no sense. If we want really this to be a world in which we all collaborate, and collaboration, I think, is the number one quality of success. Before any competition, we need the really collaboration. We need chain-to-chain -chain direct communication, and the killer nugget technologically for us to realize these decentralized um, uh, token bridges are uh, really state proofs, which is essentially a signed statement of the majority of 80% of the stake that you can go to the bank with. Because 80% of the stake of a blockchain says, we, this is true with us, that is something that you can rely on. Because if I want to go from blockchain A to blockchain B, two things are true. I trust blockchain A because I'm in A right now, and I also trust blockchain B because I want to transfer one or more assets to blockchain B. I should not trust everybody else. That's, I think, in my opinion, is collaborate. if collaboration is really the key, then this, to me, is the technology coming up of Algorand that I like the most. Natalie. Um, I mean, the killer app, I think, is Serum, which is a central limit order book style uh, exchange as a smart contract on Solana. It's really the engine of DeFi there. Um, and the second killer app is NFTs. So uh, growth-wise, there's been, I think, 5% uh, like growth of NFTs on Solana per week, um, which is kind of insane. I think uh, over 2 million people hold and, and like move these things around on a monthly basis. Um, and that's just been wild to watch. And I think the really powerful thing about these things is that the next Marvel, the next Disney will be organically built out of an NFT set. And possibly the next social networks, like the next Facebook, are going to come from these communities. Um, and these are all being built without, um, truly organically, without any like plan or intent. You see these communities form simply because it's a bunch of people all over the world that now have access to cryptography and can coordinate like their decision making through that. But 
their identity and personality is all in this kind of silly picture. Um, and it's a really powerful and simple thing. Amazing. All right, Ilya, Kevin, Silvio, Anatoly, thanks for all the work you're doing and for being here. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.